Each year, Harvard Law School invites a distinguished speaker to address the graduating class. This year's speaker hardly needs an introduction, as I'm sure you all know him from one of his many appearances on the big screen, television, the stage, and the radio. A graduate of New York University, his acting career has spanned over 30 years and has showcased his talent in roles ranging from a children's show narrator to an NBC tycoon. For these accomplishments, he has earned five Screen Actors Guild Awards, three Golden Globes, the Television Critics Award, and two Emmy Awards as Best Actor in a Comedy Series. Off stage, he has established himself as an avid supporter of animal rights and has recently provided an insider look into the world of family law in his acclaimed book, A Promise to Ourselves. It is my pleasure now to welcome to the podium this year's Class Day speaker, a renowned actor, comedian, and author, Mr. Alec Baldwin. Last night in New York, I attended a benefit on behalf of the Manhattan Theater Club, during which we screened the movie The King's Speech. So if today you should feel that I am delivering this speech rather slowly. I am perhaps channeling Colin Firth. I would also like to say that I completely understand what Mr. Hansen was referring to. I do appreciate his sentiments about Major League Baseball. I know it must be very difficult to attend Harvard and to live in the Harvard community and not have the baseball team you deserve. That must be really <laughs> tough. Because, ironically, I like to refer to Harvard Law School as the New York Yankees of legal education. <laughs> Let me first begin here. Uh, let's say, let's thank God for this beautiful day, shall we? What a perfect day for you to have this graduation or this class day. Uh, I want to begin by offering my sincerest thanks to Dean Minow and to Meg DeMarco and this year's class marshals for inviting me here, to my friend Jeannie Sook, who I suppose is the person who first welcomed me to Harvard Law School when I was writing my book, and to all of you for extending this invitation to me. It was precisely 32 years ago that I abandoned my own plan, my original plan, to attend law school and hope for the opportunity to be sitting where you are today. It was a plan that I had held on to since I was 10 years old. As a boy, I had accustomed myself to watching the evening news with my dad, who taught American government and economics in a public high school. At the time, it seemed the only way to share anything with my father back then. So there I was in 1968, tuned into Huntley Brinkley, watching Martin Luther King get killed, then Robert Kennedy was killed, then the Chicago Convention, then Nixon became president, 
It was right about then that I decided I wanted to be a lawyer when I was 10. It seemed, at least to me, that everyone who was a significant player on the political scene at that time, those shaping public policy or holding office, had a law degree. Robert Kennedy, J. Edgar Hoover, Earl Warren, William Kunstler, Warren Berger, James Goodale, John Dean, John Ehrlichman, John Sirica, Gerald Ford. Today, according to some sources, the current Congress is made up of 152 lawyers in the House and 55 in the U.S. Senate. I struggled to find statistics for how many members of Congress were held law degrees in 1968, but for now, I'll quote my dad here who said, those who write the law are usually better prepared if they've studied the law. So that was it. I wanted to be President of the United States, so I had to get my hands on a law degree. Then in 1979, after keeping this flame lit for 11 years, I changed my mind. And like a hobo hopping on a train, I moved to New York and I attended the drama program at NYU and I became an actor. And nearly every day since then, I have wondered what might have been if I had possessed the patience, the skill, and the good fortune that all of you sitting here today so clearly have. From the bottom of my heart, I envy you tremendously. I wanted help with this speech today, so I called my friend John Sexton, the president of NYU and the former president of NYU Law School. By the way, John wanted me to offer you his congratulations for graduating from the second greatest law school in the United States. <laughs> oh, that John. In our conversation, John and I talked about how much power each of you has right now, the enormous and consequential power to facilitate change in America and around the world. John pointed out to me, he reminded me how this class is potentially one of the most powerful groups of people in our society today. Think of it, John said. How many hundreds of thousands of people in this time right now, the time of the so-called Arab Spring in countries across the Middle East, dream of having the chance at an education like the one you will leave here with today? How many in China, in Africa, and those here at home who think about what they might do if they had the tools you have? tools to change their lives, grow their economies, to unburden or even liberate their fellow countrymen. In some sense, a tool or a sword, a sword that cuts both ways, a weapon that can do good or do harm. Ask them, John said, to think about the link between law and morality. And so today, I want to ask you not only to consider John Sexton's urging, I want to add something to that. I want you to leave here and save this country because this country needs your help. In my lifetime, much has changed. The rise of the internet and all of its attendant forms of communication, and yet the decline of journalism itself. 
the rise in opportunities for women, and yet a decline in feminism itself. A rise in our military spending, yet a decline in our military effectiveness and in world opinion of us. A rise in concern over homeland security, yet a decline in the number of people who were able to actually hold on to their homes. I could go on. But one thing has not changed in my lifetime, and that is that an inordinate number of the graduates of this class, of this law school, will go on to become some of the most important political actors in this country and beyond. If history bears me out, many of you will go on from here to author or administer public policy regarding environmental protection, the education of our society's children, the regulation of financial markets, the rights of individuals at trial. You will oversee policies governing immigration, communications, states' rights, campaign finance laws, and when, where, how, and why we go to war. One of you may be compelled to hunt down and kill the leader of a brigade of international terrorists. Recently, a guy from Harvard Law School, class of 91, was called upon to do that very thing. I've always told people that acting is what you do when you have no musical ability. Today, I'd like to be more precise. Acting is what you do when you have, when you have neither any musical ability or a law degree from a school like Harvard. In 1979, I chose a different path. It has provided me with innumerable experiences that I will always cherish. And I believe you would too, if you've been given that opportunity. Yet I have remained inexorably drawn to issues surrounding public policy, passionate about some, gravely concerned about others. Take the debate over campaign finance reform, an issue that I believe is the linchpin of our domestic political problems, and a tumor on the efficiency and productivity of our elected government. One may feel that this Supreme Court has had the final or near final word on the question of soft money in politics, but in your lifetime, this court will change. And as my friend Bert Newborn told me at NYU's Brennan Center several years ago, the Supreme Court did not rule on Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 because, quote, they had new information that day. They ruled on separate but equal because they knew that the country was ready for that change. They knew that the country needed that change in order for our concept of democracy to survive. By the way, two Harvard Law grads sat on the Supreme Court in 1954, Burton and Frankfurter, and there are four Harvard Law grads on the Supreme Court today. One day, a U.S. Supreme Court that one of you may sit on will recognize that we cannot offer corporations the most precious rights of citizens while, re while requiring few of the responsibilities. We need, more, we need more transparency in campaign finance laws. We need public financing of elections. NASA just launched a satellite at a cost of $1.5 billion to study dark matter in outer space. Yet we can't afford to shed any light on who gives money to buy influence in Washington. We discourage good men and women from seeking elect elected office due to the fact that many of our best and brightest people simply will not descend into the vulgarity and folly of modern American elective politics. Subsequently, we get the government we pay for. You, me, the corporations. What passes for leadership in the halls of Congress today on both sides of the aisle is too often a disgrace. 
We need laws that will bring a fresh blood supply. Many of you who are graduating from this class today is what I define as a fresh blood supply to Washington and to state houses across the country. Some of you will have a lot to say about that in the coming years and about issues like abortion, health care, clean water, nutrition in our schools, drone attacks, mountaintop mining, basket currencies, intellectual property rights. Now, some of you may decide to take the tools you've been given here and use them to make a good living, and no one would fault you for that. Nothing wrong with a little commerce, I always say. That's the American way, too. In my business, sometimes you get paid a lot of money, and the money tends to go up the further away you get from Shakespeare and Chekhov, from Williams and O'Neill. I made a choice over 30 years ago, and I do not regret it per se. I have had the opportunity to meet some of the most interesting people, interpret some of the world's greatest dramatic literature, see the world, have lots of laughs, work alongside some of film, television, and theater's most creative minds and gifted technical wizards. I've stared into the eyes of some of the world's most beautiful women. I had to throw that in there. But something has happened to me lately, and this feeling has engulfed me. And I wonder if one day it will touch you as well. It touches me every time that I visit Harvard and I am in the company of its law school students and faculty. My attachment to my work is deep and strong, perhaps more so than ever. But if I had it to do all over again, I would choose differently. I would trade places with you. My passion for politics, for public policy, for patriotism and service to my country occupies another chamber in my heart. But I am, I am limited by the preconceptions of my business. You are not. There is truly no limit to what each of you can do in order to change the quality of people's lives, manage our economy so as to balance the often contrary forces of capitalism and democracy, to unburden, even to liberate your countrymen in a myriad of ways. That power rests with you now. Use it not to do good. That is too vague a word. Use it, as my learned friend John Sexton said, to bring morality to the law. I came here today to tell you two things. One is congratulations. The second is that as I have grown older, I believe that I would trade what I have for what you'll have come tomorrow afternoon. Thank you.